health in America is about more than just symptoms and diagnosis. It's one thing to recommend dietary changes, it's another to teach dietary changes. It's about access and cost. There's a lot of hospitals like ours that could learn from this. This week we're looking at the challenges people face in getting the care they need. The pandemic has changed the thinking on so many different types of activities. And the worries people aren't preparing for a flu season, doctors warn, will be unforgiving. This is The Race. Many Americans use marijuana as medicine, and polls show the majority of Americans support legalizing medical marijuana. Here in Colorado, it's not only legal for medicinal purposes, but recreational as well. You could just go to a dispensary like this one and buy it legally. The issue, though, does vary from state to state, and we met a man who knows just how complicated the legal system can be when you cross certain state lines. Army veteran Sean Worsley says marijuana helps treat the wounds that earned him the Purple Heart in Iraq. His job was to clear explosive devices. Suffered quite a few level three concussions um, and resulting it with PTSD and traumatic brain injury. In Sean's home state of Arizona, marijuana can be prescribed as legal medicine, but that's not the state law everywhere and Sean told me he knows that firsthand. As far as how it still impacts me, Chris, it, it we're still feeling the repercussions of it. Um, like, it, it affects everything, every aspect of life. In 2016, Sean and his wife, Ebony, stopped in Alabama to get gas on a road trip to visit family. They were approached by a police officer. That was one, actually one of the first things. Did I, do you have any cannabis in the car? Where's the cannabis? Or where's the marijuana? Sean had marijuana in his car, legally prescribed by doctors in Arizona. I had my medical cannabis card. It was put away in the trunk. It wasn't accessible. While medical marijuana is now legal in Alabama, at the time, it wasn't. I felt like I was doing the right thing. Um, Evidently, it, it wasn't. Sean was charged with possession of marijuana. First given probation, he returned to Arizona where he says he struggled to afford the thousands of dollars of legal fees and even became homeless. In 2020, an Alabama judge, citing issues like Sean's past criminal charges for marijuana and his failure to meet with his probation officer, revoked Sean's probation and sentenced him to five years in prison. I didn't see how it was possible. I was, wasn't hurting anybody. I wasn't doing anything wrong. I didn't. Sean served less than a year of that sentence. Alabama granted him parole after his story gained national attention. The first thing was, you're not going to kidnap my husband and my friend and just, you're not going to just take him and just do anything to him and treat him any kind of way because you don't know him. You have a system that's a one size fits all when it's, it's absolutely not. Along with his wife, groups like the criminal justice reform organization Alabama Appleseed advocated for his release. People make gotcha statements like, well, he should have known better. He should have known it was illegal in Alabama. I would ask them how often they check the criminal code before they bring their medicine from one state into another. The Worsleys believe this issue wouldn't have happened if marijuana was legal at the federal level in a way all states would have to follow. But when we look at cannabis as a whole, it's still a schedule one drug, which means that it has no medicinal value and it's in the same level as heroin or LSD. Shannon Donnelly works in the marijuana industry and teaches college classes about it. When we're looking at federal cannabis legalization, we're probably looking at maybe a five to 10 year process. Um, some of those things that are gonna be thought of is where can cannabis be sold? What does it look like if a state does not wanna have cannabis sold? And then also interstate commerce. I'm calling on all governors to do the same for state marijuana possession offenses. In October, President Biden pardoned those with federal marijuana possession convictions. But since most marijuana cases are handled at the state level, it's on governors to decide whom to pardon. I'm just another vet that's out here trying to live his life. Meaning Sean, <laughs> who's now in school studying the power of plants as medicine, will continue to have a felony charge related to his case in Alabama on his record as he tries to move forward. 
dressed in her scrubs, Cassandra Hildreth is giving me a tour of the rural West Virginian hospital where she works. Hey, guys. Hello. How are you? Good, how are it's you? clear to me Good. that she knows every corner of Roan General Hospital and isn't afraid to jump in on the front lines. I mean, I help in the ER when needed. Um, I go to the OR. I'm a help on acute care. Even though she's a part of the hospital administration, as the Vice President of Nursing Services. If I'm asking my staff to do something that I can't do, then that's not who I am. Roan General serves Roan County, a secluded wooded slice of Appalachia. Cassandra's dedication is an example of how rural hospitals are used to being David versus the Goliath of the healthcare system, trying to do so much with the little resources they have compared to hospitals in cities or suburbs. Whether we know that person or not, we know they're our neighbor. Hospital CEO Doug Benz is proud of what his team makes possible every day, but says in the wake of the pandemic's peak, they're up against major obstacles never seen before. As a rural hospital, we had unique challenges. When you see your neighbors uh, dying and not being able to do anything about it, that made it that much more difficult. He says COVID was the catalyst that led to debilitating staffing shortages, reliance on higher salary travel nurses, and layoffs. That coupled with all of the inflationary pressures that w weren't expected, the cost of drugs, the cost of medical supplies, the cost of equipment. Now as we're facing the end of the public health emergency and that funding going away and uncertainties about other funding, Medicare and otherwise, um, certainly everybody is on alert. Struggles aren't new to rural hospitals. Since 2010, 140 rural hospitals have shut down nationwide. After there are no closures in 2021, likely thanks to pandemic funding, as healthcare attorney Brock Malcolm pointed out, we're starting to see closures pick back up again. Four closed already this year. On December 16th, federal funding to a pair of Medicaid and Medicare payment programs are set to expire. If these reimbursement programs are not renewed, rural hospitals may lose out on $600 million of funding. As the winds of Medicare blows, so goes the financial health of a rural hospital. Brock Slaybaugh is the chief operations officer for the National Rural Health Association. He says 50 to 80 percent of patients at rural hospitals are Medicare dependent. And if this funding is not renewed, more of the 700 total rural hospitals will close, something that could have deleterious impacts on the surrounding communities. They also are usually if not the largest, maybe the second or third largest employer in the county or area that they serve. So they become economic lifelines in addition to lifelines literally for care. We're we breaking for lunch? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll see you in a little bit. Whatever the future holds, Doug, Cassandra, and their team will continue to do what they always have. Get creative, get resourceful, and put patients first. And that's something that we um, really take pride in. Um, and, I mean, we just want to make sure that they're very well taken care of. I mean, that's what we're here for. In Roan County, West Virginia, I'm Vanessa Mishania. For the first time in a decade, for this time of year, the United States is seeing its highest flu hospitalization rates. And this comes at a prime time for health fatigue, as more and more people put aside their COVID safety measures, like mask wearing, hand washing, and extra cleaning. COVID, the pandemic has changed so many the, the thinking on so many different types of activities and surroundings and you hope that society becomes more protected as a result of what we learned from COVID, not less. Dr. James Nide is the director of infection medical prevention for the Medical Center of Aurora. He may be working in a state that hasn't seen high flu numbers yet, but he is still urging his community to take action. Prevention is really where it's at. If we cannot go to these extreme you know, situations, that's where we would all want it, where it's treatable and manageable as opposed to being under vaccinated and underwhelmed. 17 states, along with Washington, D.C. and New York City, are reporting high or very high respiratory illness activity. Virginia is one of them. We're seeing high levels of flu activity in you know virtually every region of the state. Dr. Brooke Rosheim is a public health physician specialist with the Office of Epidemiology in Virginia. He points out that these high numbers are in direct correlation with human activity over the last few years. We didn't see much influenza activity really because of a, a number of things. Number one, people were masking up. 
Uh, number two, and this may have been the more important thing, is that people were kind of quarantined. The CDC estimates that so far this season, there have been at least 1.6 million illnesses, 13,000 hospitalizations, and 730 deaths from the flu. These experts say no matter how tired you may be of hearing it, the answer to staying healthy is the same as it is for COVID. Get vaccinated. I think that that's maybe understandable fatigue, but the fact of the matter is there's no, virtually no downside and they're extremely effective. You know, influenza kills tens of thousands of people a year, so it's not nothing. Across the United States, flu vaccination rates are lower than usual. Experts point out that adult flu vaccinations are down about 5 million compared to where they were last year at the same time. And in addition, the CDC data tracker tells us just 8.4% of eligible Americans have received a new updated COVID-19 booster. Respiratory viruses, respiratory illnesses are problematic. They cause missed work. Um, preventing them is the best thing uh, by far. And the flu season typically lasts for, you know, four to six months. So you've got, if you haven't gotten it now, it's still a great time to get it. In Denver, I'm Jesse Cohen reporting. More to come on the race. Stick with us.